You're listening to the Relationship Centered Learning Podcast, a podcast to inspire and empower you to be a difference maker in an aimless educational system. Hear weekly from adults and students who are having a radical impact in the education space as they share from their minds and hearts, giving us practical tools that we can take back to our classrooms and campuses. Here to take you outside the educational box is author, disruptor, and your host, Kevin Curtis. Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. On today's episode, I'm interviewing Trevor Muir. Trevor is an author, speaker, storyteller, and former classroom teacher. He is known for creating the epic classroom and has a powerful voice in leading classroom teachers in a new direction. Trevor is offering for the first time an online workshop that we're going to talk about in today's episode. He was on my top 25 guest list and I'm elated to have him on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the Relationship Centered Learning Podcast where we put relationships at the center of all learning. I am super pumped excited to have Trevor on the show today. Hey, welcome to the show, Trevor. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for letting me be on. Absolutely, brother. Hey, so just like we do in the classroom, we always want to preach connections before content. So we do that in what we call the GTKY format. That's simple five, uh, five simple questions I'm going to ask you and you flip five back at me. So I'm going to start off with one simple question to start off with number one. How do you like your eggs? Oh, gosh, sunny side up, period. Me too. That's awesome. I, yeah. I think that's the only way they should be. Cooked, but. <laughs> I'm, with, I'm with you on that. All right. So when you put your shoes and socks on, are you a sock, sock, shoe, shoe or a sock, shoe? How do you put your socks or your shoes on? Uh, definitively sock, sock, shoe, shoe. Okay. Um, and, and I used to do sock, sock, shoe, shoe, tie one shoe, tie the other shoe. Um, but now uh, I like to put them on, tie the shoe, and then put the other shoe on and tie it. It's 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 a choice. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Hey, these are the little little things that, that we <laughs> we just want to know about Trevor. Um, What's so funny is nobody in my entire life has ever asked me, and yet I can tell you instantly. That's these, these, these are the things I know. See, that's what's what next? I, What's number three? <laughs> number three, just a simple thing is this: if I was coming to your hometown, where is somewhere you would have to take me? You'd be like, Kevin, I got to take you here. Oh, I would take you on a hike. Okay. So there's, this, there's this park not far from me. It's called Seedman Park, and it's just gorgeous. And there's creeks and hills, and you can catch crawdads and snakes and and hot. I, it, it's wonderful. That's where I'd take you. All right. So number four, growing up, what was that one meal or like a sandwich or something that your mom made you that you're always look forward to? Mm, my mom could cook some food. Uh, her, the very best meal is fried chicken. So I, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan now, but I grew up down in South Florida, Southwest Florida, um, and not by the beach and not by Disney World, but actually like a little bit in the country of Florida, which is a rare thing. And so my mom was just this master Southern cook. She still is. And uh, her fried chicken with collard greens just rocks my world. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Question number five. If you were switching places with me right now and behind you said the Relationship Center Learning Podcast, who would you interview? Ooh, I would interview, I would interview uh, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Peters. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to make sure. I, I, I talked to my sixth grade teacher. Okay. So then we're going to make that happen, Trevor. We're going we're to okay. come back. We're, we're, no, I want to do it. That's why I asked that question. I'm selfish. I want to know who, will, who, who would Trevor need things to need to be on this show. And I think that's, that says a lot about what yeah. that person means to you. Wouldn't you Absolutely. agree? Absolutely. Oh, hundred percent. And I'll All right, brother. about him in a bit. So. Okay. So five questions back at me. All right. What's your favorite reptile? Reptile. Ooh, that's a really good one. Um, I would probably say crocodile. Crocodile, saltwater crocodile, saltwater, saltwater crocodile, saltwater, American. Saltwater. Okay, saltwater. saltwater crocodile. Yeah, it's yeah. the biggest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're amazing. Ooh, yeah. Powerful. <laughs> uh, if you could go relive one year of your life, what, what age would you choose? Oh, man. If I could. Not including this one. Hopefully, you're living your best life right now. So you're <laughs> go back I, I got you. Um, let's just say when i was 13 13 13 I love it. what is that eighth grade yep absolutely eighth grade yeah. uh i had a decision to go between two different high schools it was a real pivotal point in my life and i'm thinking like man that that would be a really good point to go back and just relive that one year for me 
Did, did you enjoy it? Oh, I, I did. Don't get me okay, wrong. Good. I just, it was this, there's a lot. It's interesting because it's, it's almost like the butterfly effect. There's, you know, you, I had the choice of going to two different high schools. My, okay. I, all my siblings went to one and then they rezoned me for another one and they gave me a choice. And okay. so I always look back at that pivotal point because like, the, uh, not that I would change it, but the other school was very successful in athletics and I played, okay. I played football. I just, they, I, I met people and I knew people from there and I always just wonder what would it have been of like if I'd have went left instead of right. All right. Love it. And so let's go with football. What do you think requires more toughness, football or rugby? Oh my God. I would think rugby. I've never, I, now I have a friend of mine who was actually a strength and conditioning coach with the San Antonio Spurs where I live here. And he posts nothing, but he trains and coaches for rugby athletes. Okay. And I watch him and I watch the things he posts, Trevor. And I would say hands down rugby I, I, period. I, know. Oh, I mean, it's not even like close. I mean, I watch the things that he makes those guys train for. And then you watch what they go through. And, and I'm just being honest. Now I watch NFL football and I watched it yesterday. And unfortunately I am a Cowboys fan. So, um, mm. but the bad part is, is I watch it and I'm like, you can't even touch each other anymore. The way like, you, it's just <laughs> like, it's, it's, turned, sport. it's completely turned. Into oh yeah. Oh. So one time down. I was in Australia and I was, uh, I, I got to hang out with a rugby player for a while. And this guy was six, seven, probably like 280 pounds, just an absolute beast. And uh, he was talking all about rugby and, and losing teeth and all this stuff. I was like, so what do you guys do for fun? He's like, Oh, we like to tackle ruse. I was like, what do you mean? What does that mean? He's like, oh, at nighttime, we ride around on our Jeep and we, sh we spotlight with our spotty. And if we see a kangaroo, we tackle it. And I'm like, and, and you got to forgive my accent there. Yeah. But I mean, like this guy literally like his activity is to tackle like eight foot tall kangaroos out in the outback. And I was just like, you are a tough man. Yes. Like, I would yes. not want you to be, I, I don't want to be blindsided by you. Absolutely. Oh my God. That's a great, great story. All right. That's All right. three. That, oh, is that only three? I better yep. pick it up. No, you got two more. All right, two more. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs all day long. Period. You have one? I got three. Australian, ministers, uh, Australian shepherds, miniatures. Nice. Do they have yeah. accents? <laughs> no, but it's just so funny when you were using the accent. I was making, it made me think of the Australian shepherd. But yes, no, no accents. Uh, but I've... I've never owned cats, so I can't, mm. but I've only owned dogs my entire life, and I live and love for dogs. They're, right, they're, they're amazing. All right, last question. Um, if you could interview uh, somebody who is no longer with us, who would it be? Ooh, um, wow, okay. I would have to think, I would like to interview probably... It, if I, man, there's so many different people that are really quickly rushing through my mind. Um, and I'm not, I'm going to throw a loop at you and I'm going to interview my grandfather. Okay. And here's why never met him. Hmm. Never met either one of my grandfathers on either side paternal wow. or so I would choose either one of them, but I never met either one of them. And I only met my dad's mom once and my mom's mom, I was closer to out of all grandparents. Yeah. So I didn't really have that grandpa grandparent experience, mm -hmm. but, um, Recently, uh, I turned 51 a couple weeks ago, and I'm on, I'm on Ancestry.com. I did the 23 and Me, but I started looking into the history, and I started just really starting to look at some of those things, and I was like, man, I wish I would have just met my grandfather, you know, like just had yeah. a great conversation with him, know a little something about him. So that's a good question. Yeah, and you know, I actually heard last week, I, I, I've been meaning to track it down, but I heard there's research that shows that we form neurological connections stronger with the generation before our parents than even our own parents. And that's why even if you've never met your grandparent, there's a good chance that you share something very deeply in common with them. And that if you did have the opportunity to meet them, you would probably have a deep connection with them on a very like almost intangible, but actually neurological level. Wow. Which, which I just think it's so fascinating. Oh no. I li life is fascinating like that. Um, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. But Hey man, those are great questions. Thanks man. You're right off the cuff. You, you rock the, uh, the connection before content. So, okay. 
So we always, we model that just for the listeners. So remember connections before content. If you are looking for an opportunity to use those types of questions in the classroom, all you need to do is head over to the website at RCL first, RCLFIRST.com. You can click on the link and you can sign up for 28 GTKY questions. You can go back into the classroom and use them with your students. Or if you're an administrator, you can use them with your staff to use connections before content in the classroom or on the campus. So as we get into this, Trevor, I, as I mentioned earlier, Earlier. I have been a fan of yours. Um, I know you hear this all the time. I, I, no, and the reason I say that is because you make such an impact. But mm -hmm. I think one of the things that was really hard for me to understand is when you start making an impact, you don't realize who you're making an impact with all the time. So, you know, it's nice, Trevor, when you get to see people in person and they get to say like, thank you for today or thank you for the mm -hmm. message or whatever it is, right? But I will tell you, I, I have referenced your videos throughout our trainings throughout the last five years. I have referenced who you are and, 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 what, and what you preach and teach about. Um, I have just referenced you in general as one of those educators that I have said, look, it can be done different, mm. right? Listen to what this man has to say because it sounds crazy, Trevor, but it's so simplistic of your message of what you represent in teachers in the classroom, right? So just to start off, I want people to know who you are just as a general person, as an educator. So can you just kind of take us to who you are and give us a little bit of insight to who Trevor is? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I appreciate those kind words. I mean, and I, and I love that you said it's simple. It's like, yes, everything we, both of us, the work we do is very simple. Um, and, but with that simplicity comes a lot of complexity, right? Like, well said. And, and so, you know, you, to tell you about who I am, uh, you asked me earlier, who would I would interview? I had a teacher in sixth grade named Mr. Peters. And this was the same year, sixth grade, when my parents got divorced. And my grandmother who lived in my home died of alcoholism. And my mom became a single mother of five kids. And we had to deal with trauma and, and just difficulties like I've never had to face since. I mean, we've had to, plenty of different challenges throughout life, but that was the toughest year of my whole life. And I'll never forget this guy, Mr. Peters, who just deeply invested in me asking questions, building a relationship, just, just loving me um, in, in a way that nobody else really was able to during that year of life. Um, and that just had a deep impact on me. And that's why when I got to the end of college with no idea what I wanted to do with my life, I, I remember like doing some deep thinking, some exegizing for my own life. Like what has got me to where I am now? And this guy, Mr. Peters kept popping up into my head. Like, and, and I started through a whole chain of events. I decided, you know what, this is what I want to do with my life is I want to help students. I want to help people, um, you know, find ways to succeed and, and, and achieve greatness and, and love their lives. And so like, to me, it all started back there in sixth grade with Mr. Peters. And that just set me on this track to become a high school teacher, um, which I did for a while. I worked with middle school students. I'm working with future teachers now at a university. Um, but a lot of my time is spent working with other teachers now, helping them figure out different ways and ideas, really just to capture kids' hearts and, and get them engaged and excited about learning, um, which has a lot of, uh, there, there, there's definitely um, a long lasting effect when we do that with kids. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. And, and my work is really just kind of based on how do you do that? And what are some things you can do to make it work? Absolutely. No, I just, I love the realism of when you, when you talk and you present like the story, was it, and I apologize. I've heard so many of your different things, but was it the rabbit mm. that got out in the class? Was it the rabbit? Oh, the goats, the, the baby goats, goats, the baby yeah. goats, right? So when you told the baby goat story, man, it was <laughs> like, holy cow, you could literally feel your world just coming, like crashing down with everything going on, yes. right? Yeah, well, and the idea is, is like, listen, I mean, the, the story is like, I, I had a student bring in baby goats and they got out and I got in a lot of trouble and they ran out in the hallway and pooped next to a board member and my principal flipped her lid. Like, and it's a very specific story to me. But when I tell that story, the reason that people all over the place love to watch that video and hear that story isn't just because of pure entertainment. It's because if you're a teacher, you know all about things going nuts in the classroom. You know all about unplanned events happening. Um, and so like, it's just like, how do I connect with you on that? How do we tell stories that you can connect with and hopefully inspires you 
to, to go back to work with, with positivity and um, just an attitude, this mindset that, hey, if things go wrong, we can, we can turn this into a good thing. So, so earlier, you know, I love the fact that you were vulnerable enough to mention how you had a struggle when you were growing up. Did you ever find yourself when you were a teacher using that past experiences that you have had personally to help other students kind of overcome mm. some obstacles currently that they were experiencing in their life? Did you ever have to, did you ever kind of use that as a connection? Yeah, every day. I mean, that, that's one of the hardest lessons I had to learn as a young teacher was vulnerabilities required. You know, you, you have to share your own life, maybe not every single detail of it, but you have to share th this fact that you are not just this blank slate who comes to class simply to deliver content information, but that you actually have to let your students know that you're human and that you have a story too. Right, like that's something that I spend a lot of time talking about and making videos about. My first book is all about is this fact that we are all characters within our own stories. Like we're heroes on the hero's journey, um, and and we experience challenges and obstacles and mistakes, and we encounter guides and mentors along the way. And I think with students, it's really important that teachers let them know that we are heroes on our own journey as well. Um, and we've experienced challenges and screwed up and went through it all too. Um, and, and because what I've found is that when I'm more vulnerable with my students, it, it, they all of a sudden are more vulnerable with me. That, you know, I mean, when I talk about, yeah, my parents got divorced or yeah, I got in a little bit of trouble in high school or yeah, I cheated on a test and got in trouble in college or whatever it is. When I let them know that all of a sudden it's like, oh, this guy cares enough about us to tell us his true story. Maybe that may, will make me lean in a little bit more in class. You know, maybe that'll make me, maybe this guy will trust Maybe I can trust this guy with my own story. Right. Uh, it, because as you know, I mean, it's, it's the center of your work. When you have this real relationship with kids, there's going to be a much greater effect than just all of a sudden we're, we've got this relationship. All of a sudden kids engage more in class. All of a sudden kids are developing more socially when there's a relationship there. You know, there, there's cognitive development when kids feel safe and have a relationship with their teacher. And so really it's the foundation for everything. But to do that, I think you've got to have vulnerability and be honest and real with kids. So earlier you had just mentioned now you're currently working with new teachers or teachers, mm -hmm. right? Outside. So, so one of the things that I'm sure you've experienced that I've experienced as a struggle is how do we get teachers to not just comprehend and understand what you just said? How do we get them to like model or show or demonstrate? Because there, there is either a lack of comfortableness that everybody is not as mm -hmm. vulnerable as Trevor and Kevin, right? That's right. Or, or I've seen two things or seen multiple things, but the two ones is one, it's just not me or two, I'm apprehensive because my experience or something taught me that if I do this, this cuts against the grain of what education is really yeah. focusing on, which is about curriculum and standardized scores and things. And so you have this, kind of pressure that puts us in difficult situations because even if I hear Trevor tell me that message and it digest it and I understand it, but for them, their reality is, okay, Trevor, you're not in my class under these circumstances. And, and let's forget the pandemic for a minute. I'm just talking normal, regular teaching. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, when is it okay to go there and how do I do that? And then how do I get the kids back? Like there's so many little yeah. navigation points. So what, how do you help teachers navigate through those? You know, I mean, for, I start with, I get it, right? Like I get that apprehension. Um, let, let's not whitewash it. It's hard. It, it's difficult being vulnerable. You know, vulnerability is, you know, it is, there's a danger to it. You're opening yourself up. It's like exposing your ribs, right? Like there's a danger to it. And so I get it, or at least there's a potential. It, it feels like, yeah, I don't know if I want to let them in on my life like this. And so I get it. So I start with that. But then anytime I'm, I'm with a group of teachers, I can say, this is a reflection question I often ask when I speak live. Um, do you remember being with people in person, by the way? Do you remember live speaking? <laughs> vaguely, vaguely, yeah. yes. 
many years ago. So one of the questions I ask is, hey, write down the name of a teacher who had an impact on you. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, there's, it literally takes five seconds to be able to bring them back because everybody has that teacher. At least one teacher from their 13 years in K-12 education can remember that one teacher who had an impact on you, right? Like, let me ask you, Kevin, like name a teacher who's had an impact on you. Debbie Bagby. There we go. What did Debbie, and this is what I would, okay, you've got your teacher written down. Mm -hmm. Why do you remember that teacher's name? That teacher was like a mother to me. She okay. cared about me inside the classroom, outside the classroom. Like I, th there's no way to describe. It was nowhere near the content nor the curriculum about that teacher. She cared about me as a human being. And she saw, I always say t every student wants to feel valued, seen and heard. She was the first teacher that truly made me feel valued, seen and heard. Yes. And you know what, when she did that, that was going against the grain because that's not the norm all the time, especially back before we were talking about SEL and developing deep connections and relationships and reformative practices. And so she was going against the grain and yet that happened. And I can name a few teachers from my life, Mrs. Bandy, Mrs. Schwanier, Mr. Peters, these teachers who are vulnerable and leaned into relationship first. And because of that, all the academic growth followed after. But I can name those teachers. And I would ask any teacher, can you name somebody? The answer is almost always yes. Why? Because of the relationship. Well, then there's your evidence. You know what I mean? Like, I get that there's this fear to it. But look at the own anecdotal evidence that you have from your own life that you've seen this have an impact on you, like that you know this. And, and so I would start there, look at your own story. You know, don't just take my word for it. You're like, look at your own. But then also there is just great research that shows that when we develop relationships, it's gonna have all of these other benefits. And so like when we say like, oh, the, the, the norm is to focus on test scores. The norm is to focus on content area growth and understanding. Okay, that's the norm. I know, it kind of makes you sick to say that, but okay, it's the norm. Well, when you develop a strong relationship with students, you're gonna see growth in those areas anyway. So it's not like there's a sacrifice that happens. I remember I, you know, I, I had this one student, I won't say his real name, uh, let's call him Daryl. I had a student named Daryl who was absolutely, uh, what's a nice way of putting it, <laughs> a terror that when I got to know him at first. He was, a, he was a senior in high school. No, I'm sorry. He was a sophomore in high school and just terrorized every one of his teachers. And he was kicked out of class all the time and suspended all the time and basically had his own desk in in-school suspension. He was a difficult kid and he was a difficult kid for me at the beginning of the year too. And, and it was hard and I wanted to kick this kid out all the time because he just had no respect for me or my classroom or his classmates. And so like, I won't sugarcoat it. He was a hard kid, but I'll never forget. I asked this kid, I asked Daryl one day, I was like, Hey man, what do you like to do after school? He's like, man, I hate after school. I was like, why? Like, why do you hate it? He's like, cause I don't have a car and my mom makes me go home. I was like, well, can't you hang out in your neighborhood? He's like, no, she doesn't want me to get picked up by a gang. And so I'm not allowed to leave my house. And then I found out that Daryl, he told me, he's like, I fail on purpose. I was like, why? And he's like, because in summer school, that's the only reason my mom will let me leave the house in the summer is to go to summer school. She doesn't let me play sports, doesn't let me hang out with friends because she wants to keep me off the street. And so if I can get into summer school, I get to at least leave my house a little bit in the summer. And it was like my world was rocked by that. Like I never heard anything like that in my life until I started listening to other kids tell me the same kind of thing. Like this was a new experience for me. And, and, and so all of a sudden, because I asked him this question every day, he started hanging out and wanted to tell me more about his own life. And I shared a little bit more about my own life. And all of a sudden this relationship was forming and this kid would try to, I mean, I didn't always allow it, but he wanted to have every lunch with me. And he would show up before school every day because he just wanted to talk. And it was like this moment where I'm like, shoot, this kid isn't just a terror. This kid comes from poverty. This kid doesn't have a dad in his home. Like this kid has just been kicked out his entire life because life is hard and he's doing it on purpose. So he doesn't have to go to school. Like, so he doesn't have to sit at home in the summer. And also when this relationship was formed and I could start having real talks with him. And when I had to come down on him and show him discipline, he would listen to me. And all of a sudden this kid started working in my class. 
All of a sudden he passed my English class, his first real passing of a class his entire life. And I'm like, you know what? This isn't because of me. This is because we formed a relationship and that led to him engaging more in ways that he's never done before. You know what I mean? I'm sure you've seen this in your own life. No, I love it though. No, um, it's so interesting because even though our paths have not professionally crossed, I start out every training very similar to what you just said. I always say, I want you to imagine that teacher, but I take it one step further. I say, don't write down the teacher's name. Write down what that teacher is focused on more in the classroom than anything else to help you be successful. Oh, I love that. So I took, I took it one more deeper, right? So I say, mm-hmm. capture the teacher, but then write down what's, and I tell them, I don't want a list of five things, 10 things, one thing. What is that one thing that that teacher focused on more than anything else to be successful, to help you be successful in the classroom? And, yeah. and, when and we what were, are some typical responses? Oh, I mean, you get it, Trevor, but here's what's interesting. At first I started doing it. I used, and, and it was, and this was interesting. I stumbled across this. This wasn't a research base. So this, yeah. I tell people all the time, they're like, Kevin, you've published a book. You're an expert. I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm experienced. Do you know what I'm experienced in? Jacking this up for since 2012. And, uh-huh. and I tell them, I stumbled across this by simply having discussions. But then Trevor, what we did is we started writing it on post-it notes and then I would have my team collect the post-it notes and we would make a big mirage of, of how they grouped. So then we started taking pictures of them and I started putting it into the training. And so you would see how many would either write the word relationship or the word relationship was in a phrase. I would tell the one word or one phrase. Some people felt yes. handcuffed with one word. So then we would have caring, loving, compassionate investment in meeting needs, um, selfless, you know, real, authentic. And, and what I tell them is, is look, now, look at all these words up here that we just all posted by simply asking to reflect, who is that a great, amazing teacher in your okay. life, right? So then I tell them, look up there. Anybody see the word content or curriculum anywhere? Does anybody see makes great worksheets? I know, but see what I'm saying? See, and so Trevor, all of a sudden, we're beginning the day. And what I've learned in this, my niche is I use your words against you. I'm like, look, I didn't even, and I, and what I don't do Trevor is I don't give them any, like, what about this word? I don't say anything. That's exactly right. So then they're all of a sudden looking up at all these words and they're just like, oh, and I'm like, so isn't it ironic that everybody in this room data comes back and tells us that the best amazing teachers that you had experienced in your life weren't about worksheets, weren't about content, weren't about curriculum, any of that other stuff. So if I can get you to right now, take your eyes off content curriculum and focus and let's go into, let's go into what I call the three zones of learning. And I break it down, Trevor, like this, there's content curriculum and connections. And I think for me, and I really want to get your opinion on this. Content is the biggest driving. We know it's the biggest driver of why we're there, but it's the supporting of around it that that really helps content, as you mentioned earlier, be successful. But here's what I noticed. Content and correct, and correct, I always talk about discipline referrals, attendance, um, disproportionality. I mean, all the other areas of, of where we correct students to change their behavior or, the, or their grades or attendance. But I tell them, you realize out of those two zones, those are the only two that in education we're held accountable for. That's right. So what happens is, is when I say, what about the third zone of connecting? There is no accountability for connections. There's no relationship report, right? Yep. This is my hypothesis, Trevor. I believe until education changes the framework and holds us accountable for making connections with kids, we're, we're, the needle is going to move very slowly. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at it as educators, we're good soldiers. Just tell us what to do. Yep. And, and 80% of that staff will tell us what to do. 10% will always exceed. 10% will never do anything anyways. Mm-hmm. So go with the 80%. If the 80% say, tell us what to do, nobody's telling them that their job status and their evaluations and everything else surrounding that, and even pay incentives. There's districts in Texas that use incentives for pay on how they get evaluated, none of those things will reference connections or relationships. So therefore a teacher says, I hear you, Trevor and Kevin, that all sounds great. But in my world and in my reality, 
I ain't getting graded on connections and relationships. And what we've tried to do, as you've mentioned, indirectly say, it, I tell them, uh, we lean into James Comer's quote, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. Mm-hmm. And so I tell them, if you want significant scores, you need significant learning. And the only way that you're going to get significant learning is with significant relationships. Period. Period. So <laughs> what I'm trying to get you to do today is, and if you'll invest in that, I promise you'll see significant learning. You'll get the significant scores. You'll get the evaluations you're looking for. But it's that trust factor of navigating around, but nobody's holding me accountable for this. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, ditto, right? Like, I I feel like everything we're saying is, is, that's what I'm preaching. And, and, you know, like something I really is heavy on my heart lately is the idea that school only focuses on content or at least that's what the measures are focused on content, but there is so much more to a whole child and what they're capable of and success factors. You know what I mean? Like they interview or they surveyed 3000 different employers recently asking what are the number one skills sought by employers and the top four are all these soft skills, essential skills, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, organization, and analyzing um, time. And number five on it, is content knowledge and the ability to retain and process information. So it's still important, but it's number five on the list. And yet that's the one that's, that's on the SAT and the ACT. And that's the one that teachers, their success is measured on their, their successfulness is how well are your students learning this number five on the top five skills list. And so like what, one of the things I talk about a lot is like, you know what, if we don't put collaboration and critical thinking and communication, if we don't put these in the grade book, students are going to continue to see them as secondary, right? Those are always going to be like, okay, I'll do my content and then this. But if it's secondary, if it's not helping them meet success, then it's like, well, then I'm just not going to do it very well. And that's why I think we have this whole society right now that is deeply struggling with collaboration and communicating ideas. And so like, to me, there's like an analogy there. It's the same reason students might not participate in a group project because they know it's not going in the grade book. The same reason a lot of teachers, unfortunately, whether they're choosing to or they don't have the capacity to, aren't emphasizing relationships enough because it's, it's like, oh, this isn't in my evaluation. Mm-hmm. This, this, it, you know, when I see like schools being closed, there, these schools in Michigan have been closed not too long ago and they're doing it based on test scores. They're failing schools. I'm doing quotes. I know we're on a podcast. They're failing schools because students aren't getting their content academic scores up. It's like, that's one measure of success. What, what if there was rubrics that you use to evaluate? Yeah, but our teachers forming connections. Are kids staying in school longer because of those teachers? You know, are, is, are suspensions down? Are, are we having to call the police la- less? Do we have, are we, are we eliminating hunger in this district through this school system? Like those are measures that matter more than content scores, right? Those are success indicators. And so therefore I'm hundred percent with you. Those have got to be emphasized in all 14,000 school districts. <laughs> well, <laughs> right? no, well, because it's like you said, and this is why I say education is the box. The box is, is archaic and it's been, it's been shaped through the last century of, like you said, pointing us in one direction, college readiness, SAT, ACT, yeah. you know, and, and, and what's interesting is, is I imagine we were, I was on one of the podcasts and we were talking about like, like, school is like a highway a, a, a massive sets of highways but we're all pointing everybody to one exit ramp act sat college prep and i'm like but how many kids in today's as you mentioned soft skills technology are forming their own companies are developing their own video yeah. games are doing these entrepreneurs at, at early ages i mean youtubers and my, my daughter's on Twitch. I mean, she wants to be a streamer. She's like no, no different than anybody else at that age, right? Yeah. But, but they are making a living at streaming. And some of them aren't finishing high school or going to college to do these things. And so, as you've pointed out, Trevor, when is the school system going to catch up and go, okay, we're, we, need, and, and we need to revamp? Because yeah. as you pointed out, there's so many measures of successes. Look at, reevaluate. Look at what you said. Here's the top five things that are, that are companies want for employers, for future employers. Yeah. Here's what we need. And I feel like, unfortunately, the pandemic would be the perfect, I'll use the air quote, excuse to hit control, alt, delete, and blow this sucker up. Not literally. Oh. 
and let's say, okay, let's start over. Let's have different yep. measures of successes. Let's focus on connections as much as content. Let's get you know, all of those things. And I feel like, as you said, Trevor, if this was one opportunity as a pause on the lineage of education, here's a great opportunity to kind of reassess yes. and step back. Because unfortunately, I don't know how your experience has been, Trevor, but as you mentioned earlier, forget about live people. Relation, teaching and preaching relationships and connections in schools was already a difficult, a difficult road to, to be on for the last five years. Mm -hmm. You coming into a pandemic and starting schools mid-pandemic, I feel less valued than ever in the work that we do. Yeah. But yet people are saying out loud, don't forget, kids haven't been in school for like six or seven months. We got, don't forget to build those connections, social, emotional learning. I mean, we're talking about it, but yet I'm not even talking about it from a business, but we've had less interactions with school districts. And I get it that safety is number one. I get all the stuff, Yeah. but I'm like, imagine how popular we were. I, Trevor, we could not keep up with the business pre-pandemic. And now the pandemic hit, and this would be the time you would like reach and lean in oh, to relationships yeah. and connections with kids. And yet it's crickets. Yep. I know. I'm like, and, 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 and I think a lot of people think like, oh, because it's virtual, you can't build relationships anymore. It's like, no, it's quite opposite. Like you have different types of space to do it now. And, and like, you're right. Like, you know, we have to lean into like, okay, the reality is school looks different right now. Mm -hmm. It won't be like this forever, but it's, but right now, a lot of people are teaching from a laptop screen or a lot of people are teaching behind masks or there, there, of course there's obstacles, but it's like, you know what? We have zoom meetings. There's no excuse why every teacher can't have at least five minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with a kid once a month. You know what I mean? Time to say, Hey, I want to schedule with you at 10 AM on Wednesday. I just want to sit down and I want to ask some of these questions. How are you really doing? What, what, what's it been like at home? What's something I can do for you? You know what I mean? Maybe take notes on that call and send them a, a handwritten letter saying, Hey, I loved hearing about your, your little sister. Um, I can't wait to talk to you again next time. Like that, that's not that hard. Or what if you had small group meetings once a week online mm -hmm. where you have like five kids and every week you meet with those kids and it's just catch up and it's talking, it's asking questions. You know, what if you, you, what if you took some of these essays you're going to have students write anyway and you give an SEL component to them. And so you're very intentional about asking about their own lives and asking about what, um, what they're interested in and really making sure that we're hitting those emotional connections with kids while we're in this virtual space. I mean, I, I just think that there's things that we can be doing to continue to build relationships, we're gonna, which is going to amplify student engagement. And we can do it in this virtual space. And to say you can't is really a cop out. Now, is it the exact same? Is it, is it as effective? I don't know, but it's obviously, it, it's possible. And so therefore we've got to prioritize it if we want learning to be successful. I was, I was listening to the Cult of Pedagogy podcast mm -hmm. and with Jennifer and uh, Dave Stewart was on there and he talked about MGC's moments of genuine connection. And he also mentioned, and he made it really simple. Like we talked about earlier, when you say sometimes Trevor, your message is so simple, but it yet complex. Right. But yeah. he said, he, 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 he told the listeners on the podcast, he said, have you ever been inspired, affirmed, you know, celebrated by a text message? or an email, or you know what I mean? And so he yep. just went through those things. And when he broke it down there, Trevor, you're like, well, of course. And then he's like, so why is this so dang hard? Because everything that we've been able to celebrate and connect and affirm and, and you felt connected with your loved ones and others, you've been able to do that through FaceTime and text messages and yep. emails. And he said, so why are we not looking at just saying this is the same thing that can happen in the classroom? Yes. So I, I, I think you just have to, his, his call to action was whether you're on Google or Zoom or whatever platform, find the tools that you have, understand the tools that you have. And as you've pointed out, Trevor, then find what he calls MGCs, moments of genuine connection, mm -hmm. that five minute conversation with that kid, that once a week with a small group, whatever it is. And he also mentioned there was a study, I can't, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but you mentioned earlier about like embedding things into the writing that you were going to do. He referenced the study there, Trevor, that said, I think it was 67% increase where students increased their writing skills 
by having verbal feedback versus written feedback. It was like yes. two thirds. And so, so what he was saying is, is we're already on this platform of where if you can give your students written, uh, not written feedback, but verbal feedback on their written assignments. Th- so we're in a situation where unfortunately is our realistic part of how we're having to teach, but there are some pros to this. If we could just tap into it and see past the barriers yeah. versus anything else. It, it, you, are you seeing and experiencing the same things? Oh, a hundred percent. And by the way, there is a great new Google extension um, that, that I've found. It's called Moat, M-O-T-E. Okay. And uh, you can actually leave verbal feedback on students' work. And so it's awesome. Instead of typing it out, you can actually talk to them and share it. And it's like, here's a tool that didn't exist before 2020 that now exists that's going to amplify student learning in brand new, amazing ways. And it's like, we just got to take advantage of it. it, it yeah. it's, it's a new ball game. Well, and it was interesting, and I tell people this all the time. Um, I had vocal surgery in February, so I was shut down from not speaking for about 10 days. And so, and then, you know, pandemic came. I was left to do in Zooms, and I had taken a whole week's of trainings, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, across the country instead of traveling. Yeah. I had to be in my office and do this. And I will tell you, Trevor, I even went into, and I tell people very vulnerable, I went in like, this is going to suck. You know, yeah. you mean like, this is, there's no way. And I went in with Monday with a, with a poor attitude, only like seven screens were turned on. It, yep. it, it just, and, and then I started just, I started recognizing like, Hey, Kevin, come on, we can find ways to do this. By Tuesday, I was starting to say, right, Trevor. I was using people's names. I was like, Hey, was that your dog in the background real quick? You know, can yeah. you say, was that and, and be, by Friday, seriously, it took five days, Trevor, by the end of Friday, I was like, I can do this and I'm yep. loving this now. I am finding my, I am finding my groove in this, using their names, calling on them, putting them yep. in small groups. I'm just like, we can do this. It may not be the exact same, but they're still going to leave going, hey, that was the best Zoom professional development I've ever had. Sure, I'm like, exactly. hey, I'll take it. Yeah, you know, I've been doing keynotes uh, virtually and like, listen, I love being in groups uh, in the room with teachers. I just love it. There's this energy to it. There's this relationship that we all share with each other because we've all had these experiences that no other profession can relate to. And so there's something about being with people in person where there's this exchange of energy that's really hard to put your finger on. And it's something that I absolutely deeply miss right now. I do, I miss it. And yet virtually there is a form of that connection that still happens. You know what I mean? Like I, I still can do a Zoom meeting and find ways to get people to put their phones down and lean in and pay attention. Like there's still ways of telling stories and being overly enthusiastic and passionate that still gets people to engage on different levels in ways that are similar to being in person. Now, is it exactly like being in person? No. Do I like it as much as being in person? Personally, no but it's still possible. And so like, if that's what's been true for me the last six months of having to convert everything here, I know it's the same with teachers and their students too. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's different. But, But what I really took away from what you just shared was I think it boils down to intentionality. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't take a lot of effort for you to start using people's names or talking about their dogs in the background or whatever. All you had to do was actually just make sure sure that you were intentional. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, it doesn't take a lot of effort to hear her share her name, but I've got to make sure that I'm doing it. Right. You know I mean, we can do the same with students. It doesn't take a lot of effort to ask kids how they're doing or, or to say, hey, before we start every virtual meeting, I'm going to ask kids what's good. Share one good thing about your day or life and, and take five minutes to do that. Yeah, it eats up five minutes of a 55 minute class. But you know what? Like if you can get kids warmed up that way and show some genuine interest in their lives, the next 55 minutes or the next 50 minutes is going to be so much better. Yeah. And, it, and it just takes intentionality. So it's interesting you said that because again, we've never crossed paths professionally, but that's one thing that I definitely preach because I, I came up with this quote phrase. I said, you can't wing relationships. Yeah. So, and, and too many of us, if you're natural at it, Trevor, then you can, you can wing it. You can be like, oh, I can slip it in here and oh, at the beginning or, oh, I didn't get it at the beginning, but you're just, yeah. you, you're good at it. But for those 80% of the teachers that just tell me what to do, I'm like, look, 
I, I have what I call a connection, a connection calendar. And so what they do is I ask them to write, how are you going to connect with your kids on Monday? Love if, that. If you don't have a plan, you're going to wing it. And then what I try to do is I use it like weight loss. Cause you know, as adults, we try, you know, you look like you're in good shape. I ha I've had to lose 17 <laughs> pounds. I've had to lose 17 pounds in this, in this pandemic. But what I will tell you, and they had to be intense. And I've gained about 17 pounds during this pandemic, but anyway, you hide, you hide it well <laughs> under that hoodie, but I will tell you, so it's interesting, Trevor, as I tell them, it's just like weight loss and the light comes on. I said, if you didn't have a plan at what you were going to work out or how you were going to eat today, you would just wing it. And That's isn't right. it the days that you go, oh, I'm just not going to eat carbs today. Free pizza and free donuts show up or, you know, you can't. So what I tell them is, what are you going to do today to connect with kids? Are you going to, and we have what we call 60 second relate breaks. They take yeah. literally one minute, two minute connections. That's a whole class connection and 90 second spark plans. So what we, what we try to teach them is you can connect with kids in less than two minutes a day. All you have to do is pick which tool you're going to do it. When are you going to insert it into your class time, beginning, middle, end, whatever, and then start to do it on a regular basis because then it becomes in the fabric. It's intentional now. Once it becomes so intentional, it becomes second nature. Now you don't yeah. have to think about it. It's what you do. Then you'll be one of those teachers like, oh, I just naturally connect where six months ago I didn't do that. Yeah. So I love the fact that you brought up intentionality because that's the only way I can get what I call the next part is sustainability because mm -hmm. too many, how many teachers bring us in or edu I'm sorry, campuses bring us in Trevor. And then we're one and done. You know, they, yes. we, 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 we preach and teach a message and then all of a sudden they're, we're done. And they're like, Oh, that was great for the 48 hours. And then we're back to normal. Uh -huh. And so I, how, how are we going to get sustainability? I came up with this phrase and I want to ask you this before we go into what you're doing now is this build your school out of rock of relationships, not the sand of initiatives. Yes. And here's what I mean by this. I I'm a little bit outside the box thinker and I'm not, I'm not attacking SEL. I'm talking about like social emotional learning. Think about it. Right now, mid pandemic, we need social emotional learning, trauma informed practices, race, culture, diversity. There's so many things that have happened in our real lives that we need to be able to meet those needs in the school system. My philosophy, though, is that even with social emotional learning, all of those things that I just described, which are great resources for educators and needed, but you realize all of those come in a curriculum lesson based form. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, this is me, lesson-based curriculums blend relationships where if you think about it, what if I built a relationship? How are we going to talk about social emotional needs, race, culture, diversity, if we don't even know each other? Mm -hmm. My fear is that some schools are quickly going out and grabbing those huge initiatives, those big, big initiatives but they're bags of sand and they're just going to bring them in because one, they got to spend their money too. They got to meet the students needs. They got to check the box, but have they forgotten? What about building the foundation of a rock of relationships and then bringing social emotional learning on top of it, then bringing race, culture, diversity, trauma, all of the other things that we definitely need in our school system. But I think sometimes we forget the rock of relationships gives us that strongest foundation to land those initiatives that we bring into the schools. What's your thought? Oh, a hundred percent, 100%. You know, I, I remember a school district in my area got a $50 million bond to uh, just revamp their entire school. So they built this huge new wing, millions of dollars in furniture and technology. It was the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And in the hallways, there were all these booths where kids could sit and face each other. And in the classrooms, they had all of these amazing flexible furniture. It was just the most beautiful stuff you could ever see. And yet, I remember when I went to go tour that school and help them out with some stuff and consulting, I went there and every single classroom you looked into, kids are still sitting in rows and the teacher's at the front of the room and the kids are sitting in million dollar furniture and they're all just looking at the teacher at the front of the room, sit and get. And, and it was like, this looked exactly what school looked like for me in the 90s. It looked exactly what my school looked like in the 40s for my grandpa. Like, there was no difference except that it was really shiny furniture and technology. And I remember, like, there was, like, this phrase that popped into my head is that innovation without a foundation is, is worthless. You know what I mean? Like, you can have all of the initiatives and in technology in the world and pedagogy and processes. You can have all of that. 
But if you don't have a foundation that it's all built on, it's just going to crumble. It's not going to stand. You know, I, I, I talk about this in my, my project-based learning workshop is that there are a lot of fads in education. You know, I, I, I often say like fads are like bottle flipping and pogs. You know what I mean? Like you remember bottle flipping when everybody's flipping bottles? Or do you remember pogs in the 90s, everybody? And it was a huge distraction. And it's like, yeah, but you know what? Just wait. The spinners will go out of style. Like the fad will pass. And it's like so often that's what you see in education. Oh, we're going to do this big initiative and we're going to bring in project-based learning. Or we're going to do this initiative and we're going to talk about race relations. Or we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to use this new technology, this new tool, whatever it is. And then it's like, you just wait three, four years. There'll be a new principal and we'll have a brand new fad to work with. Or just wait three more years, a new technology will come out and the other one's obsolete. And all educators know this. And so like what you often see is this innovation without a foundation. And I think you just hit it right on the head is that the foundation for great learning in any environment, whether it's in school, whether it's at a corporation or a company, whether it's a sports team, I bet you could speak to that as a coach, is relationships. Like that is the foundation. Without that, nothing else has the, the potential to succeed as much as it possibly could. And, the, and maybe that's a strong opinion and take that we have, but, I, but I'm with you on that one. I mean, is I, that true in the sports world? Oh, and absolutely. No, and that's, that's why. And so what's really interesting is, and, uh, and I'm going to be really transparent here. The reason that I titled this Relationship-Centered Learning is I'm actually going towards that. And for 2021, we have been National Educators for Restorative Practices. And Trevor, unfortunately, there's pros and cons to using those, those terms. Mm -hmm. Some school districts um, will easily come towards us because we are about restorative practices and they hear relationships and accountability yeah. and repair harm. But there are some school districts that said, we don't want to have anything to do with you guys because we are, when they hear the word restorative, they're anti-restorative, right? Mm -hmm. And so forget the politics, forget left or right. It just, it's, it's, I've ran, I, I literally, this was true one time, Trevor. I had a guy tell me, he said, Kevin, I love what you're bringing. Unfortunately, my central office would never buy into this. And I yeah. said, okay. I said, hey, do me a favor. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go home and send you something. I went home, Trevor, and I typed out a synopsis of what we do, right? Yep. And I titled it at the top, R-A-P. And I sent it to him. And he said, oh my God, I love this. And I said, right. And I called it Relationships Accountability Program. There we go. And he said, oh my God, my, my central office would be all over it. I said, it's the exact same thing. I just retitled it, right? <laughs> so and <silly>. so, <laughs> well, it's so silly, Trevor, but what uh -huh. you just pointed out is unfortunately, and, I'm, and I don't think I've ever said this on the podcast. So this is going to be the first time my listeners are going to hear this restorative has been such a foundational change for me. I tell people all the time, I didn't flip. I just started calling new plays and started getting up. I tell people sometimes you're stuck with a 1999 playbook in 2020, right? Yeah. And I, so what I started realizing is, is look, restorative, using the term restorative has its limitations. And here's why, because there's a connotation that it's soft on discipline. Um, you know, it's an alternative approach, or as you just mentioned, it's a fad. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I hear this a lot, you know, Kevin, this is just going to, this pendulum is going to swing. This is going to be gone, you know, in three to five years and it's going to be something else. And I said, okay. So what I feel like on the wall of education, on the, on the uh, caveman archaic wall of education, there mm -hmm. are some acronyms that have lasted for generations and, and what I've been called etched, you know, they actually went in there and etched, you know, certain yeah. acronyms, right. And SEL will be one of them. Sure. And so I'm, I, I'm, I want to make this very clear. I'm not against SEL. I'm saying I want to be like SEL. I want to be an acronym that embeds in education and makes long-term changes. Unfortunately, my five years in experience working in restorative, I feel like I'm a Sharpie on the wall. You know, like, in other words, I'm the big bold Sharpie. I'm on the wall. I'm making a difference, but there are a lot of people are like, oh, it's just tag. And, and you know, and that'll, that'll fade away like anything else. And it made me realize, Trevor, relationships. If I called it RAP and the guy was like, dude, that's, that's it. I, that I would be all over it. I'm like, well then, so what, what I've run into is I've run the course of understanding that if I want to go forward, and this was pre-pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, then I have to have a rock of foundation of relationships yep. and that never goes away. So that's why I chose relationship centered learning as my platform moving forward because relationships at the center of all learning, the rock of relationships has been here since the time of education 
And it is in every, it, like you said, it bleeds over into professional, personal families, relationships, everything. So I don't want to hear relationships and the learning is a fad. It's, I want to hear it as the rock. I want to hear it as a foundation and it should never have gone away. And it still should be the center of learning as we move forward. And, and again, pandemic gives us that great platform to finally say, let's, let's control all delete. Let's, let's renew and let's, let's figure out how to get these relationships and connections back at the center of learning because it's been pushed to the side for too long. That's my Amen. thought. I love it. Absolutely. All right, brother. Well, hey, I want people to know not only what you're doing for the people that you contract with, but there you have some virtual opportunities and some yeah. ways for people to get involved with Trevor. So let can we talk? I want this is your time to tell people what you're up to. No, I, I this is why I wanted you on the show. I want people also to know. I'll tell you, I already sent your virtual online class to my people oh, and awesome. said, hey, take a look at it. So no, I, I want people to know how we can get involved with you and what you're up to and how they well, can kind of learn about a little bit about what you're talking about, just like I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just released, uh, I don't know when this is being released, this podcast, but I just released here in uh, mid-September uh, a new course for virtual teachers um, because I, I just, it, it's so abundantly clear that most people didn't go to school to become a virtual teacher. Most people didn't do their student teaching from a laptop screen. And so there are a whole host of new challenges and unknowns and about how to do this well. I know one of the things that's always kept me afloat as a teacher and educator is the successes that you see in the classroom. It might be a really hard class, but then when you see these individuals successes. That's what helps fill you up and keeps you going. Um, and yet in the virtual space, some of those successes look different and they're not received in the same way. And so it's like, well, how do you thrive as a virtual teacher? How do you manage your time well? How do you simplify curriculum and focus on what's most important? How do you build relationships with students behind a screen and using Google Voice? What tools and resources can make your students' lives easier and therefore your life easier? Um, how do you manage assessment? All of these big questions. How do you take care of yourself um, when you're working from home or working alone in your classroom and you're isolated and you're putting in more time and you have more to grade and more students, uh, how do you do all of this well and still be successful and not just have to bide your time until pandemic teaching is over, but actually thrive during it? Um, and so I created an online course, um, which is eight modules, about 15, 16 videos that uh, are, are just walk you through these big topics and then activities and tools to help you with it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's released now. And, and I've kept it really, you know, I, I, I've tried to keep it as affordable as possible because the idea is, is how do, can you make sure every virtual teacher has the opportunity to thrive? And I think there's a lot of ways to do that. And I think the course would definitely be a way to help people learn some new ideas and practices um, in this very temporary, but also very real unknown. So uh, yeah, I, I can share the link with you, but it's, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud and excited about having this course out there. Mm, no, I love it. Um, I love the fact that one thing that I have not been able to really do yet, but it has been talked around me for years is getting with new teachers. You know, yes. like Kevin, I, you mentioned you're working with the university. I've had a couple, you know, I only have a master's. I don't have a doctorate, but a lot of, I've had some undergraduate talk about teaching this relationship tile style course as, as a prerequisite for some teachers or yep. even alternative. And so I would love to get into that space because how many teachers, if we can get this information that you are bringing and I'm bringing in front of them proactively so that they have it in their toolbox and on their tool belt and, and the mindset of understanding what it's going to take yep. with a modern day student to connect with them and understanding those five things, as you mentioned, I think teachers could come into education more wide open eyes wide open well and let's be honest in the past this wasn't possible in the past you couldn't create a virtual online course that's easy to use and and but now we've got that technology just like what we said earlier like in the past building relationships with students in a distance learning environment would have been really really difficult like right. when i was a senior in high school a hurricane knocked down my high school and it knocked down my house and i had to live in a fema trailer for an entire eight months um but for one month of it there was no electricity no power um, and we had no school for a time. And so we were out of school my senior year for over a month. And I had zero, zero, zero contact with my teachers during that time. And it's like, if that happened now, of course, it'd still be a tragedy. It'd still be right. difficult. But like teachers have ways now to connect with kids that we didn't have back in the early 2000s, right? Like th those right. things didn't exist back then. 
it's like, so we've got this blessing of technology, um, which can also be a curse sometimes, but it's also a blessing. And so now it's like, how do we take advantage of that? I would love to go and sit down with teachers all over the place and talk about how do you thrive as a virtual teacher? How do you build relationships with kids? How do you make that a foundation? I'd love to get back on an airplane and go and travel and be with teachers, but we can't right now. And so it's like, all right, well, then what do we do otherwise? Right. And so that's what the course is an attempt to do. Um, and, and I'm really excited that you know, it's just another way we can just kind of help people figure out how do you thrive as a professional um, during this difficult time. Well, man, I want to thank you for not just the course, for helping, in my opinion, this is Kevin talking, in my opinion, you have helped myself and many other educators figure out how to thrive. You, you mm -hmm. have done it in so many different platforms. You're an amazing storyteller. You have genuine and authentic real stories. And you're not afraid to be vulnerable with your, your listeners and your followers. And the fact that you are consistently trying to figure out as you're growing with it and, and with education, that's what I admire about you. Um, I mm -hmm. think that you are one, as I said, one of the top 25 people that when I first launched this podcast, my producer was like, who would be in your top 25? And, and I'm not just saying it because I, I was literally Trevor Muir. Oh, I appreciate um, that. Absolutely. Um, and, and so I, I just was like, what you've given us is you've, rem you've given us to me those gentle reminders at times, but powerful reminders to not lose focus or to mm. not give up hope or not to not lose it, uh, to not flip our lid or to not even leave education. I, I think Trevor, for many of us, I have used your voice through my platform at time to say, listen to what he has to say. And, and I think, mm. and I, and I think it's made a difference for not just my listeners, but for me personally, you have mm. inspired me. You have given me confidence in reminders that when I took this journey and left public education and tried to navigate through trying to be whatever an educational consultant is, I just had to tell people I'm just an educator trying to make a difference, but I don't know how to do it in this world because this world's completely different. But I want to thank you because what you've also done is, is you've given me an, 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 a light and an encouragement that this isn't being done for nothing, that we, mm. we can make a difference in the fact that you've created a virtual course, the fact that you're still out there making differences, your videos, the people. So we're going to put in the show notes, Trevor, we're going to put everything that you want us to, as far as a link to there, a link to, to, to connect with you on social media, all of the things, a way to follow with you. We want to make sure every one of our listeners gets an opportunity. If they haven't already been inspired by you, I want to, I want them to hear you and I want them to hear your message and what you are about. And I want them to start understanding how powerful the message that you bring can help educators get back up off their feet or stand tall in what they're doing. So thank you for what you do. Well, thanks, Kevin. That means so, so much. I'm honored by that. And yeah, it's, it's just an honor that, that I get to be part of other people's lives and, and their careers. And so many people are a part of mine and they have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm inspired regularly by people that, that have no clue that they've touched me. You know, I, I'll go back to that Mr. Peters. I, I talk about that guy all the time. I've made videos about him. He's in my keynote. He, he, he's, he's in my book, my first book, The Epic Classroom. He is a huge part of my story. And a lot of people have heard that story. And yet I cannot for the life of me find that guy. He's not on social media. He's not on the internet. I cannot find Mr. Peters. And I think that's kind of a beautiful thing. Not that I can't connect with him because I will at some point. I'm going to figure it out. But it's more that that guy planted a seed in this 12-year-old. And he has no idea that like it led me on this journey and on this path. He's just living his life, hopefully knowing that he had an impact on a lot, a lot of kids throughout his career but he doesn't know it. And I think that's just something that all teachers have to keep in mind that you might not always see, sorry for being cheesy, what that tree grows into. Um, but what you are doing is planting those seeds um, that if you water them and keep giving them opportunities at some point, they will grow whether you get to see it or not. And that is the beautiful work of a teacher. And so oh. thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. And I love this conversation. This was a good one. Very rarely does anybody want to have a podcast and talk for an hour anymore, especially in the teacher world. So well, I like it. 
Well, good. I appreciate your time today as an investment. That was one thing I told myself. I wasn't going to box myself with a number or a certain minute, whatever the conversations were. They were um, for you, for me and my listeners, Trevor. I know we're going to take away um, a lot of great things from our message today and being inspired and encouraged, but also being informed. And, 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 and I always say this, power and permission. I think what, what we both are trying to do is empower our teachers with permission to say, you can do this yeah, and, and it can be done and it's not impossible. But as we talked about earlier, being intentional, um, having a plan um, and using resources, if you're not familiar with them, learn. And this is a great opportunity mm-hmm. for us to learn. So I'm glad, Trevor, that you've created something for us to all follow in your footsteps and learn about how to become a better online teacher, but also just how to be a better person, Trevor. Thank you for what you do. Thanks for being on the show and we'll connect with you next time. Yep. Thanks so much, Kevin. Bye, everybody. Lastly, I want to thank you, the listener, the educator, the difference maker. Your time is valuable. I see time as an investment. And I thank you from the center of my heart for making it to the end of this episode. But please don't let this be the end of our relationship. If you have the same passion for putting relationships and connections at the center of all learning, then I need you to subscribe and share this podcast with other like-minded educators. It would be extremely helpful if you could leave a review or a comment on what you loved about this episode, or better yet, tell me what you want to hear more of in the future. This way, other educators that are searching for impactful podcasts can get a sense of what this show can offer them. My hopes and prayers are that you are able to find one strategy or one idea that you could take back to one classroom to make a difference for one kid. Thank you for keeping kids and relationships first. We'll connect with you next time. Try that again. Lastly, I want to thank you, the listener, the educator, the difference maker. Your time is valuable. I see time as an investment. And I want to thank you from the center of my heart for making it to the end of this episode. But please don't let this be the end of our relationship. If you have the same passion for putting relationships and connections at the center of all learning, then I need you to subscribe and share this podcast with other like-minded educators. It would be extremely helpful if you would leave a review or a comment on what you loved about the episode, or better yet, tell me what you want to hear about more in the future. This way, other educators that are searching for impactful podcasts can get a sense of what this show can offer them. You see, my hopes and prayers are that you were able to find one strategy or one idea that you could take back to one classroom to make a difference for one kid. Thanks for keeping relationships first, and we'll connect with you next time.